welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at muskets and tomahawks. So this is going to be a new series that I'm going to put up um, probably every every Monday morning, Sunday night, depending on, on how it goes. So uh, on, on Tabletop.com there was a discussion about uh, critical reviews of games. And uh, I thought, well, that'd be cool. It'd be good to see some some game reviews. And uh, I, I thought I'd have give it a go myself. Uh, I'm going to work with a formula here. So the formula is going to be uh, five good points about the game. Five things I really like. And of course, I'm going to kick off with muskets and tomahawks. I love this game. Five good things. Three not so good things. Three things I'm not a fan of. Things I either house rule or um, ignore or would encourage people to find alternatives for. And finish it off with the one thing that makes the game special. The, the biggest thing that makes the game special. So for example, um, for bolt action, that would be the dice system. Uh, revolutionary dice system when it came out. It, it totally changed everything. Uh, I understand it's not the first of its kind, but it, it was, for the gaming market, it was revolutionary. For this, well, you'll have to wait and see. So let's get started with a review of Muskets and Tomahawks. So Muskets and Tomahawks by Studio Tomahawk, the, uh, the same people who do Saga. Uh, I do not believe you can actually purchase this from them anymore. I believe it's out of print, but there's a second edition in the works, if you believe internet forums. So, Muskets and Tomahawks. Uh, skirmish game set in the French Indian War and the American War of Independence. Uh, there are lists for the American War of Independence and the French Indian War in here. Uh, there are also conversions for the Napoleonic Wars. But uh, I'm just looking at the main rulebook. Uh, literally, this is you've just got the rulebook, and um, I'm assuming you're using all the optional rules. So the side plots, the weather, that sort of stuff. Not in every game, but you, they are open to you. You're not exclusively writing anything off. So the the first good point of this game is the side plots. The side plots, oh, side plots should be in every game. Every game should have a side plot. Um, it's a side plot is not a secondary objective because a side plot is unique to to your army. Uh, you roll a two d six, a tens and a one, so you get um, there's something like forty five because six of them are the same thing, literally to stop the enemy. And uh, the side plots are, you can't win by achieving a side plot. If you get a draw, it becomes a minor win. It basically just bumps up your the end victory by one or two point by by a single point. Sorry, um, but a side plot is something that, that changes the way you play the game. For example, um, you're defending a village, but it turns out one of the houses actually belongs to your officer, and so he has to end the game uh, in or around that that building because that's where his family is, and so he his his goal is not so much to protect the village, but to protect his his personal home. Uh, could be a side plot. Another side plot could be that your officer hates the men in a particular unit, and so that unit must be must be wiped out or severely um, damaged by the end of the game. Alternatively, it could be that he quite likes the men in a particular unit, and that unit can't take a lot of damage during the game. The side plots are so crazy. They're so well, not crazy in a good way. As in, you know, there's there's one where you've got a hostage, and you have to you have to fight the battle, but you also have to make sure this guy doesn't run away. Um, but the enemy doesn't know what your side plot is unless it's blatantly obvious. And even even with a like, you might think a hostage is blatantly obvious. But uh, is that a hostage or is it somebody translating a document? Uh, if I scare that officer off, is that that's he going to run away or is he going to follow? Uh, you know, it's it's very very um, interesting. And uh, I think I think the side plot system could be ported into almost any game on the market. Uh, and a game that couldn't have a side plot ported into it, a tabletop miniature game. I'm not talking about like hex encounter or divisional level stuff. Um, a skirmish game. Any skirmish game that couldn't have side plots put into them, I would have to actually question why not, and is that necessarily a is that game necessarily? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, um, what what's wrong with that game that it wouldn't allow um, side objectives to be put into it? Is it so finely razor edge balanced that that anything could just topple it over the edge? In which case, I th yeah. You know, I think you guys can understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, it, I think that any game that um, that is that is good and of quality can have side plots put in it, and I'm going to take that as a challenge. Uh, please, if you have a skirmish game that, that you don't think would actually have side plots in it in a way that would enhance the game, uh, drop it in the comments below. Number two, the full rules for weather are included in the book. Ah, oh, this sounds. This sounds a little a little weird, but oh, you uh, you cannot imagine how amazing it is to have rules for weather included in a skirmish game. Um, whether or not it's raining, it actually plays quite a big deal in, in black powder skirmish games. Whether or not there is snow all over the battlefield, uh, even a lot of wind, it's just it's you don't throw it in every one of your games, but it is just nice. 
it is so nice to be able to go, it's raining today, it's raining outside, it's miserable, you know what, let's have some rain on our battlefield, or, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's boiling hot outside in the Australian summertime, why don't we play in the snow, or how about we recreate uh, Robert Rogers fighting in the snow, battle on snowshoes, of course, in, in the French Indian War, why don't we do something like that? just to add some fun to the skirmish game, to, to tell this story even more. Because as far as I'm concerned, when you're skirmish war gaming, you're telling stories. Um, you're telling the story of, of this officer. And you should... You, I personally always name my officers, and I try and name at least, you know, one or two sergeants or some character figures. So I, I, I really think that having the weather in the rule book, having um, genuine, balanced, uh, properly thought out weather conditions in a rule book is just fantastic. Number three, the morale system is not broken. Um, the morale system is fantastic. So you've got, oh, I keep saying fantastic. The morale system is very good. So you have, uh, when you roll a D6 and there's a chart, and depending on what type of unit you are, you can get certain results. So the two main results are flight and recoil. Recoil basically means you're pushed back, but you're not running away. And a lot of games don't do this. A lot of games have you either you push back and that's all that happens to you or you know what I mean like sometimes you're you're either running away forever or you're running away and then you instantly rally again what recoil does is recoil says right you have to move a full movement backwards um, or if you're in cover you can lose your next activation uh, but flight is where it ramps up flight means you you run a full movement backwards and that's it that's your turn you're recovering you're getting your stuff together but where it really comes into its own is uh, different unit classes have different um, morale. So you roll on a D6 chart. Uh, there's a quite a lot of charts in Muskets and Tomahawks. I like that personally. Some people don't. Um, and depending on your morale class, depends on what sort of what row you, what sorry, what column you're um, you're rolling on. And of course, regulars have a much better chance to run away. There. Uh, have a much better chance to stick around than than civilians. Uh, but also, there's so many modifiers, and um, it's not to the point where it becomes gratuitous or confusing so the modifiers are actually quite easy to understand have you been have three or more men die in the unit yes okay that's a neg two have you been shot point blank with black powder yes okay there's a negative have you been shot by someone in a firing line a negative are you native troops in cover that's a positive you know it's it, there's is an officer nearby positive they're, they're very intuitive bonuses they're very um there's no morale modifier that would have you look at it and go I don't understand why they're getting that bonus or, or I don't understand why, why this thing has happened and yet no one's getting affected by it. And just the fact that, that the morale is not uh, do or die. If you can, you can fail a flight test and, and you're going to start running away and that's bad, but you can get them back or you can, you can use the recoil to your advantage. So say your main infantry line gets pushed back, they get recoiled. Uh, your skirmishers can then go, right, the infantry's recoiled, they're going to come back again, so we can we can sort of modify that, rather than having this sort of random, uh, almost like taking morale checks or rally checks, the the, the knowledge that you're, either, you're always going to stick around, because in a skirmish game, if you're running away, you might as well just take the models off the table. Uh, the idea that you can actually recoil and then bounce back later on in the fight is, is a big plus for me in my book. Number four, there are officer character traits in the book, and they are thematic. Um, I love building characters <laughs> with my with my skirmish games. I think, yeah, I've, as I've said before, I think if you're playing skirmish games like this, you 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 have to only have some character just you know naming them. And there's a process there where for five points you can give your officer a trait, and uh, this can be it can be one of the generic traits, or you can actually roll on a, on a chart. So if you have a provincial officer, he's going to have different traits than a, than a regular officer, and uh, a Native American uh, sachem, some a sachem sachem. Uh, an Indian leader is going to have different traits to a professional British soldier or a professional French soldier. Uh, there are no faction ones, so it's regular, uh, irregular, provincial, and Indian civilian, I think, are the, are the four. But, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're, there are different traits. And they're not brutally overpowered. They're, they're actually very flavorful. Um, you can have multiple, or I would advise two is the max. So having the traits in there lets you... Um, it doesn't have a campaign system, but it's actually quite easy to bolt on a campaign system to this game, purely because you have these traits in there. So having them in there is, is a really good enhancement to the game. And again, it's not something you have to use, uh, but if you do use it, it's not going to overpower the game. It's not going to domineer the game. It doesn't turn your... Um, it's not like 
like SPQR where your your leader abilities are actually cr- like you build your whole army around a leader ability. Or, well, that's really not fair in SPQR, but you know what I mean. It's not like um, it's not like Hero Hammer, which is sort of some people's um, way of saying Warhammer. I believe seventh or no sixth, where you're literally building whole armies around characters. Yeah, um, it, it's it's just sort of like okay, well if you're if you happen to be nearby this officer, he's a, a particularly harsh drill master, so. He pushes the men a little bit harder, and you get a plus one on your your rally checks. Or um, this guy is famous for training his men to reload fast, and he really drives you through your paces. So on a six, uh, on five or a six, you get a free reload action, um, or your reload becomes a free action for that one uh, one action of shooting. Just nice, flavorful things where you go, you know what? This is my officer. This is his story, and and here it is reflected on the tabletop. Number five, the table is interactive. Yes, okay, so what do I mean by the table is interactive? This is something that's actually going to come up in a few games. If there's a building on the table, you can burn that building to the ground. If there is a stream on the table, you can have boats. Uh, you can purchase boats for army and they can go up along that stream. If there is a wood on the table, you can get in the wood and it's not just more terrain. Uh, so many games just have woods being woods. So okay, that's terrain. It's like being behind a fence. Being in a wood is like being behind a fence. Um, Munskins and Tomahawks, there's actually a spotting chart. And, all, and it won't really come up in a lot of games, but if you're a Native American unit in a wood, you're actually quite hard to see from across the table. And uh, those long-range guys with rifles might not be able to target you if you're within a wood uh, compared to just being sort of in a field with, with terrain. So, so yeah, woods actually have a purpose. Streams have a purpose. You can have boats come down that you could go, right... I like to see the way the table set up here. I'm going to drop one unit of Indians and instead give my other two units of Indians boats, and they're going to come in from that flank over there, and they'll they'll use the boats to get into position. You know, it's at the table is interactive. Things aren't just impediments to your army. The the the, the you know you know what I mean. Like the stream is not just something to cross. The the building is not just something to get in the way, and it's like ah damn it, that enemy units in the building there. If I could just get him out and and. If I could get them out of that building, I, I could take their center. I could throw their army in disarray. Well, you can. You can set fire to the building, or you can attempt to. Anyway, it's, it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it can be done. And I think that at this level of wargaming, to be able to to interact with the table is a, is a, a massive, massive plus in my book. So to the dislikes, um, these are things that I think should be. I don't necessarily hate them. Um, these are things that should be house ruled. I think. Uh, things that, not even bad things about the game, just things that irk me, things that take you out of the game, things that make it, um, it feel less, things that make it feel like a game rather than a, a story or a reenactment of something, so, things that sort of make you, you start looking at it like, oh, okay, this again. Um, so the first one is the officer casualty system, in that there is no officer casualty system. If you're within four inches of a friendly model, you can just remove that model instead of your officer, and uh, I just... Do not like this at all. Um, officers got shot a lot in the uh, French Indian War. I've actually written an article series on Beasts of War slash on tabletop.com. It's not a great series. I really should go back and, and redo part of it. Um, I really should just, even the project system, I might make some videos about it actually because it's a fantastic war, but the series isn't, isn't that great because it was written like five years ago. But um, a lot of officers died. So let's just run through the first, I don't know, first ones that come to my head. We have Wolf. And the Marquis de Montcalm at, uh, at Plains of Abraham, which was a 15-minute battle, and both commanders were killed. Uh, we have General Braddock, of course. We have uh, we have uh, Captain Bayou and uh, Major General Braddock at the Battle of the Monongahela. Uh, Johnson is killed. I could go on all day, but the, uh, uh, I have a theory that the smaller the engagement level, the higher the chance of the of the commanding officer being injured or killed. Um, obviously, that's that's not a, a great revelation. But uh, it's something that should be looked at when playing war games. And so in my games, I basically use the sharp practice system for, for determining an officer casualty. Um, although I tweak it a little bit. So you have to roll one under the amount of wounds inflicted to, to, to get an officer casualty. So, um, oh, sorry, t- two under, sorry. So with the, the way sharp practice works, if you do two wounds and you roll a one, that means one of them is the officer. Uh, in Muskets and Tomahawks, just because there's no system for being an officer wounded, so you did three wounds, you'd have to roll two under three, which is one. So you'd have to do three wounds to, to start hurting officers. Um, but it, I think it, it needs a system where the officer can actually be killed. Because right now, in sorry, right now, but in the main game, 
you can do some pretty crazy reckless stuff with an officer and it's like, well, you can't technically kill him or maybe the officer is actually quite good. So I mentioned before about having a trait. If their trait is reload and uh, they're really getting lucky with those dice, you're like, ah, oh, I just got to kill this guy. But there's 16 bodies in between you and him. I think having that, that chance to, to, to reach out and, and, and get this guy is, is something that has to be added to the game. And it's super simple. Roll two under the amount of wounds inflicted. Um, for, for guys with rifles or special units like uh, um, Courier de Bois, I, I've got a French friend who did once tell me uh, two weeks ago the exact way to say that, and I've forgotten. But I think it's Courier de Bois, the runners in the woods, the, the French sort of, um, they, uh, the French woodsmen who'd been in contact with the natives quite a lot and were quite good marksmen. Um, Canadian militia are actually quite good marksmen too. They're much better than uh, American provincials. Um, anyway, so if something like that, you can maybe have one under rather than two under, but yeah, you, you get the idea. Number two for the, uh, the dislike, the layout of the book is not fantastic. Um, for example, the, the one that gets everyone the most and really annoys me is that the, you roll for your missions, and I'm going to talk about missions at the end. So you know, hold up, because missions are going to be coming in what makes the game special. Um, so when you roll for your missions... You roll on a chart here, and then you have to turn to the back of the book to find out what those missions are. And the missions are listed 1, 2, 3, 4, but in the back of the book, they're listed 1, 2, 3, 4 in a completely different order, uh, which is very annoying. Uh, the missions themselves are fine. It's it, The layout of the book is, is really annoying. Um, I prefer books like uh, Valorant Victory, uh, Sharp Practice, Chain of Command, which are set out with number points. So it's like uh, Section 10, Shooting, 10-1, Acquiring a Target, 10-2, Cover. 10-3 reactions, like something where you can go, and then 10, uh, say 10.1 requiring a target, 10.1.1 line of sight, like things like that, which really break it down in, in minutia. Whereas um, Muskins and Tomahawks, until you really pick up how the game works, then you never have to reference the rulebook ever again. It's such an intuitive game. Uh, I really want to hammer that home, that this game is very, very easy. There are very few modifiers to the amount of dice you're actually rolling, other than guys you have in the unit. I, I don't think there's any, to be honest. It's a much, much more intuitive game than a lot of stuff out there. And I'm not slamming any games that I'm mentioning. I'm just saying this is, this is a fantastically intuitive game. But boy, is there, there's a little bit of a learning curve just for actually reading the rulebook. You have to bounce around. It's not in color too, which is disappointing. Um, I don't particularly care that much, but, but a lot of it, there's a lot of painted miniatures in the rulebook where you just... Eh. I'll see if I can find one right now. Uh, for, yeah, here we go. For example, that would just be so cool if that was in color and the, the entire book is not in color save for the uh, the front with this sort of uh, dual layer and the back. So um, it, it's really, really disappointing. I mean, and look at the, the quality of miniature painting is not subpar. They're actually fantastically painted miniatures. Uh, those are Perry miniatures, I believe. Uh, they do give credit to the miniatures um, who's, who painted them and where to buy some miniatures. I would recommend Perry miniatures, Warlord Games, and Galloping Major. Uh, that's who, that's who, whose miniatures I use. Galloping Major for Provincials. I believe they've even got a French line out now, which is something they were always lacking. Um, they were always liking f actual French army. They had British and provincials and stuff, but anyway. So yeah, the layout of the book, uh, it is soft back, and it is very easy to get spiral bound. If you take it to someone like Officeworks for about $15, they will spiral bound the book for you. But um, yeah, so that's my second second negative point. My third negative point, and remember we're playing the game with all the optional rules, exactly as the book says to, is that there are too many random events. Um, there are, oh, I don't know what they were thinking. But um, the way the game works is you put cards into a deck, you draw the cards out, and that's how you activate. Uh, so one card will say regular two, so each of your regular units takes two action. There'll be two of those cards. Provincials have a one, a one, and a two. Uh, irregular units have four ones. So irregular units activate more often, but with the same activations as a, as a regular unit. So a regular unit um, it, it's, it's a really good way of simulating the way they behave. So a regular unit does two things at once, but it does four actions total. Whereas an irregular unit does one thing at a time, but four actions total. So an irregular army is much more... Uh, an irregular... So you mix them together in an army. So an irregular element of an army is um, is much more reactive. Oh, and of course you activate the entire... Uh, all irregulars act activate on the irregular card. Okay, so that's how the cards work. But anyway, they tell you to add three event cards. And don't add three. Add one. Add one event card. One event per turn is quite nice. Three event cards is just annoying because the, you get the same ones over and over again. Um, a lot of events just aren't that great. The turn ends immediately. Cool. It's okay. Uh, one event card per turn, fantastic. 
Uh, there's some really cool events in there. One of them is there's an angry farmer in one of the houses. He pissed him off. As he's just going to fire a shotgun at the closest unit to him. Um, that's cool. There's other events like... Um, the turn ending card isn't always bad, but um, having three of those cards mean they can pop up a lot. So, just one. Just one event card. Um, just have a single event card. The events are really cool. Officers can be killed. Officers can come out from units. You men might find a whole stash worth of old muskets or rifles or something. You, it's, you might find a whole bunch of shotguns somewhere. Uh, an Indian force could stumble on a whole bunch of bows or rifles. Like there's, there's really, really cool events. It could become, there could be an eclipse, and uh, for the next two turns, it's nighttime. It could start raining. It could stop raining. The events are, are really cool, but just have one. That, that's that would be my best advice. And the third and final sort of negative thing I, 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 that really sort of um, is always house ruled in every single game I played is is just have one event. So to cap off the negatives. Or, I don't want to say negatives because it's the, the things that I would change and I do change is have a random officer casualty um, have a random way of determining officer casualties um, the rule book layout is something I can't change but uh, it would be cool to see if they ever republish or even better if they put out a second edition would be to have that um, that also put into place in a little bit more streamlined and of course put one event card don't put three if uh, you can do the game with none I would recommend one because it's fun here we go. What makes Muskets and Tomahawks special? What makes this game unique? I suppose unique could be better than special because special sort of um, indicates something positive, whereas unique could be positive or negative. So, uh, unique for this game is absolutely hands down the system of determining objectives. So, what you do is you take a look at your army and you say, right, I've got 24 British regulars and 10 rangers. So, for a for American Army and the American and the uh, French Indian War. You got ten Rangers and twenty-four regulars. That is a regular army because more than half the army is regular. Uh, if there were thirteen Rangers, it would be a mixed army. If there were twenty-four Rangers, ten regulars, it would be an irregular army. You can see where this is going. Uh, and depending on what type of army yours is, you roll on the chart with a modifier. And uh, on the chart, there are six scenarios, and each player has their own objective. Your objective might be to defend your village. You're defending a small town, a small village, uh, a farming community of four houses or so. And the enemy's job is simply to scout the area. They have to move one man into each sixth of the board. So the six by four board is divided into um, two by two, six two by twos parts. And they just have to get a guy into each of those two by twos and get half their army off the board. So your objective is also to stop the enemy. Is That's also one of the objectives. So your objective is to not let the village burned down but at the same time you don't really want the French scouting you so it, it introduces this really cool dichotomy where it's like okay they're not here to burn the village down but they will if I give them an opportunity they will burn it down if I don't if I don't stop them um, it's very easy for them to send one guy one unit sort of over here and torch the barn and that'll that'll screw up my game because that fire could spread or you know you don't want to lose the barn and I think the the system of having each player having its separate objective is, is really unique, and it's something I've not seen in a lot of games. Um, a separate random objective, sorry, because you could quite easily sit down and say, right, your objective is A, your objective is B. But uh, in this system, you actually have custom objectives, um, depending on what type of army you have. Uh, an army comprised mostly of Indians is never going to be defensive. Um, you could always just say, well, they're defending their own village, but uh, if you roll randomly, uh, an Indian army can only raid, slaughter, or pillage, I think, of the three. Uh, anyway, I might be wrong. But uh, they can only do a raid, which is burning down villages or trying to get supplies. Uh, slaughter, which is basically there's a, the enemy gets some civilians. Your job is to kill them or well, something else like that. Uh, regular forces are more inclined to do defensive actions rather than offensive actions. Uh, irregular forces have an equal chance of getting everything. So I think it's really cool to be able to sit down and say, right, imagine this in a system like four, Warhammer 40,000 where you've got a Dark Eldar force up against a Space Marine force. The Dark Elder are pretty much always going to be on the offensive. Uh, so they're going to be raiding, capturing, torturing. They're, they're going to be trying to, to destroy things. Or an Orc force. Orcs are never going to be defending their own stuff. Because, or, well, they, they do it, but it's, it's quite rare. Uh, so, you know, maybe you've got an army of, of uh, Death Watch Marines. And the Death Watch Marines don't really defend stuff. Go in the offensive. I think it would be really cool to to introduce this random system for pick-up-and-play games. Which is, which is mostly what it's for. Uh, it is a points game. Uh, points are good because you don't actually need to use them, but they, they help balance the uh, the forces. So you could say, um, well, here's two armies I built. 
Uh, they look about even. Let me just add the points up. Yeah, they're only 10 points different. Let's go with them. Uh, so I don't think points are something you should actually necessarily follow 100%. But they're a good way to double check that you're almost like um, doing maths by hand and then using a calculator at the end. So, um, so yes, I think the system of unique and almost separate objectives is a fantastic addition to Muskets and Tom Hawks. So thanks for watching. It's the first video I've made on this topic. I'm not sure how long it is. It says 26 minutes. We'll get that down with editing. So if you'd like to see more videos of this type, uh, drop a comment below. I'll move on next to, uh, to another game. So uh, you'll have to come back to the channel and find out what. So hit the like button, subscribe, come back to the channel. Thanks very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.